welcome to all of you and welcome to this program. What I'm trying to do today is really, this, this is really just a mind opening <coughs> and a, a sort of a bit of a challenging session to get us into the sort of the intellectual mode of thinking about the future of digital business. It's not an examinable subject uh, or lecture. This is really just to get a conversation going. I think that's point one. Secondly, it is about understanding the philosophy within which this program really exists. So it's one thing to say we're doing a program on digital business, but what is our thinking context that we've put this program together in? Uh, and wh what, what sort of, where do we want to take it? And what is informing what's in it and what's not in it and so on? So I've been talking about digital business probably for about six or seven years. I remember actually it was my first digital business presentation was in 2011. And I remember when I did that at one of our customer events, the, ge the general reaction was like, hey guys, talk to us about something real. Don't talk to us about sci-fi, talk to us about something real. But since then, the world has evolved and now everybody's saying, hey, digital business is coming. What are we going to do about it? But the problem when I speak to business leaders is that too often our digital business strategies feel a bit like this. We're in this pantry with all these amazing ingredients and we've got a little bit of, if we take a little bit of consumer to consumer and mix it with a millennial workforce and then put it into the network effect with some AI, we might reach a tipping point and develop an exponential business. But the problem is that we've got all these ideas and these ingredients in this digital seller, but do we have a strategy or a recipe take all these ingredients and put them together in a coherent response for our business that actually takes our business forward and does actually create competitive advantage for our businesses. And do we understand how they all fit together, that we as individuals know how they fit together, that we can add value and actually enhance our own school skills base. So I guess the first point by context for, the, for this program that we're on is what we aim to do is to ta talk a lot about a lot of these ingredients, but help hopefully give you the tools and the insight that actually know how they fit together and where they should be used and where they can be used and where they shouldn't be used and so on. The second thing that has struck me when I speak to people in industry is some people say, yeah, I mean, I know, we, know, we know Apple is a tech business and we know that Uber is a tech business and BCX is a tech business, but I'm in food processing or I'm in um, automobile retail. And how does this whole digital thing apply to me? Now, I think the point is, to a greater or less extent, it applies to almost everybody. So if we take an economics 101 view of the economy, the, the economists typically divide the industry or the economy into three or four layers, depending on a particular view. But everybody agrees that the most basic, you get the primary industries, which are things like agriculture and mining and forestry, fisheries, the so-called extractive industries. And some people would say that these are at a slightly lower um, risk of disruption than other industries. Now, whilst I agree that the risk of immediate disruption may be a bit lower, I would argue, for example, in agriculture, the capability of drones to do precision agriculture can actually change the industry substantially. I would suggest that in mining, if you want to mine at 14,000 feet underground, where it is unsafe or, or not feasible to send people to do mining, uh, you can send robots this size and extract an ore body that's this thick rather than an amateur to dig a slope that's this deep. And you can fundamentally make mines that were not viable before the digital age. You can make whole mines viable again. So I would suggest that's probably a conservative view, but let's even take that. So those are the primary industries. Then you get the so-called second industries, manufacturing, processing, you know, process control, beneficiation, which I think we'd agree are probably a little bit more ripe for disruption. But then you get into the tertiary industries, which are the services industries, financial services, logistics, retailing, um, the, the, the running a hospital part of healthcare, and so on. And I think we're already seeing banks and that being disrupted. So we're starting to see the service industries, they are absolutely um, at risk of significant disruption. And then, of course, we get the fourth layer, the so-called knowledge services layer. So that would be research and development, media, legal services, the sort of diagnostics part of healthcare, consulting, education. These are absolutely knowledge services industries and we've seen huge disruption there already and we're going to see much more disruption going forward. But the point being is some people might say, yeah, but that's okay, so it's only these, um, it's only these guys at the top of the pyramid that really need to worry right now. I'm down here, so I'll wait till tomorrow. But the problem is the South African economy 
actually looks like that in terms of the share of economy. So the overwhelming share of the South African economy is actually at the services of the knowledge services layer. And if you then overlay on that the degree of risk, we see that two-thirds of the South African economy is at substantial dramatic risk of disruption. Another quarter of it has got significant risk. And there's only about 10 to 15% that could say they've got some time before this digital disruption. So I think the second thing of a point of context is I do think it is important for us to recognize whether you're working in BCX now and maybe somewhere else tomorrow, whether you're thinking about yourself and about transforming BCX now or about going to the BCX customers tomorrow and talking to them about their transformation, is to recognize that the vast majority of the industry is ripe for disruption and will be disrupted at some point over the next five or 10 year journey. Now we might think by the way, 10 years is a, like, hey, that's the distant future. Remember, I mentioned that I started speaking digital disruption seven years ago. And it seems to me like a blink in an eye almost that that was. So, so seven years uh, in, digital, in the digital world is a long time, but in a human career, <coughs> it's not a particularly long time. So it is important that we uh, get on top of this. Now, let me take a little bit of a detour here. So to say, yeah, we need to get all the tools in the toolkit, that's cool, and that most of us are going to be disrupted, that's fine. But the question that we have is, so let's now try and think about why is this thing we call digitalization or digital business changing stuff so much? We've had technology waves come and go before. We had the, the computer come and go, well, it's still with us. But we've had the steam <coughs> engine come, we've had electricity come. So, you know, what, what's, what's different? Why is this one so fundamentally disruptive? And to answer that question, I'd like to take a little bit of a detour. And it starts from an, a, a, a view that I have. I think we all agree that digital business is about innovating and being creative to find new sources of value and new ways of doing things. Now, I have a view that says creativity and innovation happens when two previously separate things come together. And it's in this overlap between what was previously separate and we get real innovation and creativity. So let me give you some non-tech examples and business examples and then I'll make it a bit more real. So when we put hydrogen and oxygen together, we get water, something which is completely different to the two things that made it. When we put fuel and heat together, we get fire, which is something completely different to the two things that made it. When we put women and men together, we get hopefully love, <laughs> which is often completely separate to the two things that produced it. And when we put egg and sperm together, we get life. And those of you that know a little bit about my, what, what I'm passionate about, when we put blues and gospel music together, we get rock and roll. So the point I'm trying to make is when we put different things together, that's when innovation and creativity sparkle. When we put tech and transport together, we get Uber. When we put tech and hotels together, or B&Bs, we get Airbnb. So intersections create something that is, you know, we always talk about synergies, one and one plus two. Intersections about putting one and one next to each other and intersecting, you get 11. When you put one and one next to each other, you actually get 11, you don't get three. So that's, in a sense, the power of intersections and the power of digital. Now, that mean, that brings us to the context for digitalization <coughs> in this program. <coughs> digitalization, of course, rests on the technology enablers that, that make it all possible. So whether that's artificial intelligence or robotics or virtual and augmented reality or mobility or blockchain or cybersecurity and all these different building blocks that make up this, that underpin this digital revolution. That's really important because without them, we wouldn't have digitalization. But it's actually about something equally important. And it's about how our society is changing. It used to be just that just the millennials wanted um, you know, instant on, on demand personal services, that only millennials were interested in social networks. But now we're all becoming active citizens, active customers. We all want things personalized, on demand, real time, all the time. We're all becoming part of this new society. And in fact, I'd say that um, Facebook and Twitter are more about the way society has changed 
It's more about the online socialization of society than it is about the tech. I mean, the tech's fine, I guess. But it's not, you don't think, you're going to go on Facebook or Twitter and think, what awesome tech. It's not using proprietary tech. It's about the way the society has changed. There's, an, there's a third ingredient to this, and that's about the way business is changing. And we all used to talk, you know, now we talk about B2B, we used to talk about B2B, either you're a B2B business or a B2C business. Now we're wondering, are we a B2B2C business? What is everybody's, all the rage is platform businesses, where nowadays you don't need to own assets, you know, like Airbnb is the biggest hotel chain in the world and it doesn't own a bed. I mean, we've all heard that, right? But then at the same time, we know that um, um, Netflix has to own the content to Game of Thrones, and DSTV has to own the um, football and rugby rights and so on. So what is it about that? We have to own some critical scarce resources. But there's all these new business models, platform business models, scarce ownership models, about peer-to-peer -peer and virality. And there's all these new tools in the toolbox. And again, to give examples, I would suggest that Uber is more about the business model than the tech. Again, we don't look at the tech and say, awesome. Yeah, it's nice, it works, it's slick, but it's about the business model. Airbnb is the same. And therefore, the reason that this technology revolution, this digitalization revolution is so powerful is that it's this intersection between this underlying enabling technology, the way our market and our world is transforming so fundamentally, and the way that we do business to actually get value out of that is changing so fundamentally. So again, to come back to our program, yes, we have a module on tech fundamentals because it is important, I think, that everybody understands the language and the basic state of the art and the taxonomy and you know where these technologies can be used and where they're going. So we have the tech fundamentals. But it's also about how the market's changing. So an introduction to digital marketing, how, the, how our world is changing, how we engage with it is changing. But our customer experience, what do our customers want and how do we actually engage with them in a better way? and then also about changing business models and practices. So these are absolutely critical in our view to the program and have informed how we've put this program together. Let me, so, so it's one thing now to say, okay, so we understand some of the facets of this digital revolution, but does that help us put together a plan to respond, a sort of a strategy to respond? We have our sporting metaphors. Now today I'm not going to use cricket as a sporting metaphor or football because there's always a loser. Um, <laughs> But I am going to use tennis, and I'm going to use Roger Federer because he was born in South Africa, so we'll claim him, right? He's ours. Um, he also was recently voted the top of the, the sportsman of the year a few weeks ago in the Warriors. Awards. But the question I'd ask is, so why does Roger Federer make so much money? If he played badminton, would he have made as much money? Of course not, right? So the reason, it comes down to two factors. The reason Roger Federer makes so much money is firstly, Tennis is a very lucrative sport. If you look at all racket sports on average, the average of the top 10 earnings is 1 million US dollars per year. Tennis, the top 10 players earned on average 14 million US dollars per year in 2016. So pick the right game to play. If you pick the wrong game, you're not going to get rich. So don't play squash or badminton or table tennis, play tennis. The second thing is you've got to play it better than the other guys. Roger Federer made so much money, 57 million dollars in 2016 because he competed better, he was better at it than virtually anybody else. So business strategy is like, I mean, at, at, its, at its most basic, business strategy is, is, is that. It's about choosing the right segments, where to play, and once you've made your choices about where to play and where not to play, it's about how do you play there better and compete better than the other guys and make sure that you win. So I'm going to go a little bit now into um, the where to play. I'm not going to focus today on the how to compete, that will come through and bubble up in most of the, the, the different modules. But let me share with you a few thoughts, not exhaustively, but some ideas on where to play. It's interesting, business is a bit like sport. You've got to pick the right game. So now, yeah, this is the average economic profit across 3,000 companies uh, in different segments. And you'll see in some segments, pharmaceuticals, wireless telecoms, oil and gas. It's, uh, the companies, on average, make a much better economic profit than if you're an airline. It's a tough place to make a lot of money if you're an airline, ask SAA. It's a tough place to make a lot of money if you're an electric utility, <laughs> ask ESCO, right? So, but the point is, it doesn't mean you can't make money. It just means, on average, the sector performance is, is harder. 
So, you, you know, you need to understand this. Now, you might say to me, but hang on, guys, we're in diversified telecoms for arguments. So you, you can't affect that. That's just the nature of what BCX is. So how then do we understand what does this mean for us? There was also a study done that looked at the top 200 growing companies in a period of seven years from 1999 to 2005. And they grew during those seven years a compound annual growth of 8.6%. Now, if you guys in BCX were offered a compound annual growth of 8.6%, you would bite my arm for it. That's, that would be fantastic. So that's, that's pretty good growth. The interesting thing is, where did it come from? Well, 5.5% of that 8.6%, in other words, two-thirds of all that growth, came simply from being in the right segments. It was just, it's called the momentum of the segment. If they were in wireless telecoms, wireless telecoms was growing fast, so they grew with it. If they were in pharmaceuticals, that particular part of pharmaceuticals was growing fast, uh, they grew with it. So for example, I don't know, I think it was Aspen and antiretroviral was in South Africa, they grew with it. Sort of generic drugs in South Africa, it was a good sector to be in in the period 2000 to 2010. The other third of that growth, 3% of their growth, came from buying it, mergers and acquisitions. So you go and you say, we want to grow, we'll go and pay for that growth. So effectively you buy the growth. What's actually really fascinating and a bit disheartening for a person like me who used to run a sales organization is that an insignificant amount of the growth actually came from growing market share. So it was a case of, you know, let's take BCX. If, this was, if, this, if BCX was in the sample, it means that you didn't get bigger by getting, taking business away from your competitors. It just came from buying it or from being in the high growth segments. So the question, therefore, is that the, probably the most important choice that a company must make with regard to growth is picking the right portfolio of segments to play in um, to make sure that you're in these growth segments. And wh what's important there is that you've got to get it right at the right, right level of granularity. <coughs> and let me just build this quickly. So the global industry classification standard divides the global economy into 11 sectors, 24 industry groups, 68 industries, 157 sub-industries, and thousands of segments. Now, to give you some examples in the technology, the, in the sector is tech, media, and telecoms. The industry group is telecommunications. The industry is the operators within that. The sub-industry is the mobile operators. And the segment is mobile data. Now, I think we all know that telecoms operators are not growing. We all know that mobile operators even aren't particularly growing because the fixed voice part of what they're doing is under severe pressure. But it's the mobile data sub-segment that is actually growing dramatically. Let's take a completely um, uh, different example, which sort of reveals a little bit about me. Um, the sector is consumer products. The industry group is food, beverages, and tobacco. I guess you don't want to be in the tobacco industry when you get down to this level, because it's shrinking. The industry is beverages. The sub-industry is wine. And the segment is sparkling wine. Now, it just so happens that the wine industry, you don't, if you say, I'm going to be in wine, the, the industry is not growing. So the only way to grow if you're in wine generally will be market share growth. And we've seen what that delivers. But the two spark there's only two segments of the global wine industry that are growing. The one is sparkling wine and the other is rosé. Mm -hmm. So why do you think Graham Beck has said they're going to ditch all the other wines and focus only on sparkling wine? Because Graham Beck is a smart businessman and he's tapping into the growth segment. So when people talk about getting into growth sectors and so on, you don't want to be in a growth sector. You actually need to be in growth segments and have the right portfolio of segments to actually show that your growth will build on that segment momentum. So when thinking about where to play, find the right high growth segments. Now, where do we find that? Well, there's, there's a few ways to go, but let me come back to tech, because BCX is a tech business, my background is tech. So let's just think about this sort of idea of intersections in the tech space, and I'm gonna build this, so I have to stand here a bit. It's actually interesting that the tech sector didn't exist really until around 1900, and then the telecoms age was born with fixed line telephony, crank the handle, plug in the plug, and you have a telephone, right? And that was the tech sector until about 1970, when computers and the applications that ran on them came along. So that then we got computers and programs that ran on them. And then about 10 years later, we had a lot of these computers, and we decided we needed to connect them together, so the field of data networking was born. And then about five to 10 years later, 
we actually thought we wanted these computers on our desks. So this idea of IT devices and PCs and that was born. And then about uh, three or four years after that, the mobile age dawned on the world with mobile telephony, 94 in South Africa with Vodacom and MT. And towards the end of the 90s, the internet burst onto the world and changed the world forever. And then in 2005, we got 3G networks, so we got mobile data. And in 2007, we all got our iPhones and learned what to do with our 3G. And actually, there has been another part of the tech sector since the 40s, and that was television and video. But it's been stubbornly separate. It's always been considered you've got the media sector here and you've got the tech sector here. And what's actually interesting is up until literally five or ten years ago, these were all completely distinct segments. The players in each of these categories became household names and ruled the world, like Cisco and IBM and Microsoft and Verizon and AT&T and Vodafone and Time Warner. But what we've seen happening over the last literally five, maybe seven years, is they're coming together. We all see fixed, I mean, fixed voice and the data network coming together with voice over IP and IPTV, uh, IP telephony. That is one of your biggest problems at the moment, is what happened, what's happening to your fixed um, voice business. Mobile voice and fixed voice are coming together with converged offers. Mobile data and fixed data are coming together. When you connect, do you particularly care if you're on a 3G connection or Wi-Fi going into DSL? No, you don't. You just want to be connected. The internet has come much closer to the core network with Web 2.0 um, and peering stuff and so on. The, the applications, the infrastructure and the applications are all coming together in cloud services. And virtual desktops are making that this whole issue of the separate um, PC, and now you've got virtual desktops, and the tablet, I think, is the most amazing example of our mobility <coughs> and the IT devices coming together. And at long last, this mobile, the video world, is actually coming together with, it's been considered part of the tech sector, and you've know, got Netflix and Showmax and so on, and it's all coming together. And my view is that all the interesting stuff, and it has been for a while, that all the interesting stuff in the tech sector is happening in these intersections, in the overlaps between previously disparate seg segments. I remember when I was still at Telcom in 2012 or so, I had a meeting with the HSBC head of the global telco analytic practice. And he said, what's your vision for Telcom and BCX? Well, it was Telcom at that point. And I said, we want to be the leading converged player in the continent. And the guy scoffed at me. He said, yeah, he's convergence, he doesn't see it on income statements. Well, I beg to differ now. You see it on every income statement. If you don't have a quad play or a triple play, you actually don't have a telco business. And it's not a static process. Of course, we're moving towards a situation where everything comes together in digital lifestyle and digital business. But then we come back to that point I made about all the interesting stuff's happening there. And if you don't play there, you don't have a business really. Because that sounds a little bit provocative. Now, what's interesting, if you look at the top 40 global tech companies, you get one group of them that are what I call the traditional category players, AT&T and Verizon and BT and Vodafone play here, or China Mobile. Motorola and Sony play in the devices space. Dell and Lenovo, Toshiba play in, the, in sorry, in this devices space. IBM, Fujitsu, NEC, HP all play in the sort of the apps and software space. Yahoo and Akamai play in the, in, the, in the internet space. Time Warner in the media space. These are what I, Cisco and Juniper in the fixed data networking space. So that's what I call my first cohort, the so-called category players. Then we get a second group of companies that have actually made quite good progress migrating a significant part of their business into these intersections. So like Microsoft with virtual desktop, voice and IPT and cloud with Office 365, Oracle and Symantec and SAP and VMware moving you know, virtualization and cloud services. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, Comcast, which used to be a traditional cable TV company, now doing really well in terms of web services, internet services, and streaming. So there's a second group, what I'd call the, 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 the guys that have successfully partly migrated into the convergent spaces. And then you get a third category, and almost a far categorization. Is Apple a devices company? Is it an entertainment company? Is it an um, uh, internet company? It sort of defies categorization. Is Amazon a retailer, or is it a... Um, tech company? Is it, a, is it an application? Is it Alphabet or Google a search engine or is it a navigation company or a smart cars business? Now what's interesting is when you look at the financial performance of those three different cohorts. The first group, the so-called category players. So this is if you look at their share price 
over the period 2000, May 2007 to May 2017. And the, look at the share price in terms of compound annual growth over that period. And you'll see these guys, some have gone forward, some have gone backwards, but not a lot. And on average, they've shown a 1% <coughs> compound annual growth in share price over the 10-year period. And in a slightly inflating world, you're actually going backwards. You're certainly going nowhere very fast. And, and by the way, I'm not meaning to disparage them, because I think most of those companies are really well managed, and they're trying really hard. But they're just playing in the wrong space. Then you get that second group, the so-called hybrid and evolving players, the guys that have moved a significant part of their business into the, the, the intersections. And we see they've actually done pretty well. They've shown 9% compound annual growth over a 10-year period. That's very good going. So they've done well. And then we get the truly convergent players, those that defy categorization, that are playing in spaces where people have never played before. They've shown a 40% compound annual growth over a 10-year period. When you take that over 10, 10 years, you get thousands of percent of growth. So I think the data is overwhelming that the interesting stuff in the tech space is happening in the intersections between previously separate categories of technology. Which, by the way, is the challenge and the opportunity for BCX, because you have the opportunity to play there. The question is to find the right products and services where you can play there profitably and better than the competition. And it's saying you, that the where to play is there. The how to play and how to win, I guess, would be the bigger question. But I think if we go back to the Ubers and the Amazons and blah, 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 the question is, they're not even really just tech companies. And I think the real opportunity is it's when technology meets banking, or when technology meets media, or insurance, or retail, or transport and logistics, or healthcare, or social service, or education. It's in these intersections that I think real value can be created. And I think that's where the, real, the new wave of value creation in the world will come from. So to summarize that part of it, I think the second part of where to play is in the intersections between previously disparate parts um, and previously disparate segments. There's an important third area, and we have been talking about the Ubers and the Airbnbs and all the usual examples, right? But you guys and many people often ask me, so when is Africa going to get <coughs> our own 10 cent? Or when is it going to be an African Alibaba why is it always just American and Chinese companies that, you know, when is, it, when is it coming to Africa? So I actually did this work while I was still at Telcom. He said, when is Africa going to see, what, when is the digital opportunity for Africa? Is it real? And if so, when will it happen? So what we did is we started thinking about it a bit scientifically. And at first we said, but hang on, guys. The reason you get these um, digital giants forming in those places, look at their digital readiness there, you know, whether it's any of these measures, they are so far ahead of South Africa in terms of digital readiness. But then we said, but hang on, we know, we have a fairly good understanding of where, for example, device, devices, smartphone penetrations go. We have a fairly good example of where um, data usage is going. And in fact, we've caught this up quicker than we expected. So we actually have a much better a lot of these digital readiness indicators are more predictable than financial performance. So we said, let's then try and understand what, was the, what were the contextual factors that allowed the US to reach a digital tipping point. And if they were real there, we might get there at some point and be able to predict our digital tipping point in, in South Africa and Africa. So what we did is we regressed about 12 or 13 different factors, smartphone penetration, internet usage, e-commerce usage, education, etc., etc in the US against the financial performance of the US digital companies. So what you see is financial performance in terms of revenue, profit, and valuation. And what you see between the red and the green line, the red is the financial indicator, the green line is the digital readiness, is an incredible correlation between digital readiness, according to this particular set of measures, and financial performance. Now what you'll also see is at about this point in 2009, there was a significant uptick in digital readiness and uh, market cap. And we call that the digital tipping point in the US, which was in 2009. And then the question is, when will South Africa be at the same level of digital readiness that the US was in 2009? I won't say we've caught up to them, because they'll have moved on. But if we can get to where they were in 2009 or 2010, then hopefully the market readiness 
and the environment is there that we'll see an African digital tipping point. And the question is, when will that be? And the answer is just about, it should have, according to this, it should have just about happened. And we'll get there very soon. So if you we believe that digital readiness is a necessary condition and is highly correlated with the financial performance of digital businesses, then our digital readiness in South Africa and Africa is evolving, and we should be at a digital tipping point imminently. Which means that people who get in with the courage and the foresight now, and, and you know, just share the determination and courage to get in now and early, and with the risk appetite, because there'll be a lot of failures. But it says that so Africa should reach its digital tipping point. I don't want to say, but you know, at least predicting the future is a dangerous thing to do. But in the, in the next three to five years, we should achieve our digital tipping point. So I do think that Africa has got to be on our, road, our radar when it comes to where to play. The final thing that we have to figure out is how to navigate global competition. Because when I used to go to Cape Town, I'd use Excite Taxis. These were the guys I actually used. And they gave me a fair service, and they were well-priced, and you could even book online and so on. But then, unfortunately for them, these guys came along. And of course, I haven't used Excite Taxi since, and I'm sure you guys are probably in a pretty similar boat. Now, you've got to feel a bit sorry for them, because they were there minding their own business, competitive in their own context, but they didn't even think of themselves as a tech business. They're a taxi business. And then along comes a global giant and just kills their business. And, there's, and it's going to be like that for many businesses. Let me give you another example. Who remembers Mixit? <laughs> right? They were global leaders in, in, in online chat, or sort of mobile chat. They had 7 million subscribers, or active users. And then along came these guys and killed their business. Okay, there were some management issues, I believe, as well. But they died. So the point is being first in your market or having a nice little domestic niche isn't necessarily going to save you. Because you're going to get some global giant, whether it's an Amazon or an Uber or an Airbnb or whatever that comes along and kills you. There are a few things you can do. So these guys, whether it's um, wine business or cars business, they're very, very tightly integrated with their supply chain. So in terms of their business model being very integrated with their supply chain, it's hard for a global guy to get right. Or you can simply be best at the customer experience layer. And I'd probably put um, Net Florist in the same category as this, but I think Yappy Chef for me is absolutely world class in the custom experience and being world class at what they do. So you either really need to have a superior customer experience or you need to be better integrated into your supply chain or frankly, you're at risk. And being better integrated into your supply chain can mean owning a mining license or it can mean owning a wireless license, so, you know, um, owning Spectrum. But we do need a critical thing we have to get right, and again it's in the context of this program, is let's understand the dynamics of global competition and how do you navigate the dynamics of global competition. So, those are just some opening thoughts on where to play. I'm not going to talk too much, I'm not going to talk further today on how to compete in the interest of time, but also that is going to evolve as the course goes on. I do want to, though, spend some time talking about the challenges. Because as aspiring leaders, in this digital economy, as the, the future leadership of the business. We need to recognize that this digital disruption is not all a bed of roses. There's a shadow side to it as well. And it's really important that we have a responsible, mature, informed, and active view with regard to this. So let me sketch about a, a few challenges, and then we'll see where time is. So the first is, and this for me is probably, well, certainly one of the most important, if you remember seeing this, this was released in the middle of last year. It was some work done by, published in the Harvard Business Review. And it said, um, so this plotted how, how, how well are countries doing in evolving into this digital space. And it said, are they getting, what is their rate of change? So are they getting better, faster? And what is their absolute score? And there, there's South Africa. And at first, at first I was a bit affronted because I mean, I've traveled, as I'm sure some of you have, I've, I've traveled to many of those countries. And I don't perceive them to be at a completely different digital readiness to us. Yeah, I mean, I know Hong Kong and Singapore and, uh, you know, but Chile and Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, I mean, I've been there, they, they don't strike. And then I got to thinking, but hang on, hang on. The problem is, which South Africa are you actually talking about? 
because South Africa actually looks like this. Now let me talk to you a little bit about this because I think this is one of the most important things we as digital leaders have to challenge ourselves with. South Africa looks like this. There's 25% of us, a quarter of us South Africans, and by that I think it's all, virtually all of us in the room. We're in this group. We live in, suburb, we live in formal dwellings, formal houses, in urban areas. We're educated, we're connected to the internet, we spend money, we shop at Woolworths, we drive cars. We earn, between us quarter of the population, we earn three quarters of the gross household income in the country. You'll notice the numbers, actually it's a quarter of us. So it's not purely racial thing, because only 5% of South Africa are so-called white, um, and a quarter of the population are in that category. So it's not, it's, there's a huge racial correlation in this one, of course. But in this area, it's a mix, that, that's all, all races are in this affluent formal. But the fact is we live the same as people in Malaysia or Turkey or London or Tokyo. But let's talk about these ones. These are the folks, they live in backyards in urban areas. They live in informal dwellings in urban areas. They live in traditional areas. They live even in formal dwellings in rural <coughs> areas. They are not connected to the internet. They don't have access to electricity often. They are not as well educated as, the, as, as this group. And they don't live the same as people in Tokyo and London and New York. And they don't live the same as us. We shop at Woolworths, they shop at PEP. Um, we bank at FNB, they bank with Capitec to the extent they bank and so on. Now, I don't mean that disparagingly because the really important thing is to understand our context. This here is the economic divide and it is the digital divide. And it is really important for us, if we expect to have a sustainable future in this country, we can't say, well, let's carry on. These guys get more digitally empowered and more digitally empowered if these guys don't also. Because you'll end up, South Africa is already a bimodal society. Tabo Mbeki was sort of not particularly popular when he said we're a bimodal society. But the data is that we are. And unless we don't bring those two nodes together, we're really going to have a problem. So the question, coming back to this, is probably South Africa, you know, part of South Africa is down here in the digital readiness and another part's up there. What is important to us as leaders is, is that when we think about strategies for our business and for your customers' businesses, as I mentioned, I made a sort of a flippant comment about Woolworths and PEP or FNB and Capitec. But it is important that our digital strategies do need to recognize which sector of the market we're going after and that we, our, our, our response needs to be contextualized relative to the market we're in, point one. Point two, as leaders in the South African economy, we have to recognize this and, and confront it and have the difficult conversations around it about what we're going to do about it. But the third thing about it is we do need to think carefully about this. I mean, who remembers when the internet came in in the late 80s, in the, in the 90s? The internet is the most, it's about, it's, it democratizes information, right? It's the most democratizing platform ever invented because it makes information available to three quarters of the people on the planet and information equals knowledge and knowledge equals power and power equals wealth right so therefore it's going to democratize wealth well no actually what's actually happened is you see in this incredible concentration in a few companies I mentioned the global leaders earlier but um, at this point so this was in about October last year these were the three big companies Apple Alphabet and Microsoft which between the three of them had a market cap almost as big as the GDP of Africa. Now I know market cap and GDP are different things, but it serves to illustrate the degree of concentration. Just at the moment, Alphabet, um, certainly, or Apple, should I say, has a market cap almost as big as the entire JSE put together. Now the JSE is not some small sort of small economy um, stock exchange. It is one of the leading emerging market stock exchanges in the world. It actually suggests the level of concentration. So now the response we have as leaders depends on where we come from. If we're representing the other part of South Africa, or if we come from a more statist sort of socialist background, and I don't, um, our response is, hey guys, this can't be right. We have to intervene to fix this. We must regulate, we must tax. We need to distribute from Santon to Soweto. But the problem is you're not, you don't have to distribute from Santon to Soweto. You have to distribute from Silicon Valley, San Francisco to Soweto, or from Shanghai, because the wealth 
is the, the concentration is a global phenomenon, not a national phenomenon. So this is one of the challenges that we have to do. On the other hand, if you're, a, if you're an entrepreneur, or us in businesses, let's be honest, it is our job as employees of a business to figure out how do we create value for our business. So our response, the, the more sort of capitalist response is, hey, this is cool, give me a piece of the action. How do I get my share of this concentration of wealth? And I think the answer for us has to be a little bit of both. We do need, as I say, we represent our businesses. We are business leaders, and it is about how we derive value for our businesses. But we have to do it in a socially responsible way, because the amount of concentration and the social inequality is not sustainable. And as leaders in the, global, in, in the South African economy and the digital economy, that is one of the biggest challenges that we have to confront and think how to deal with. So the first of my challenges I'd like to highlight is this issue of concentration and inequality. There is another one, and those of you that were at the session in December will remember I spoke about the future of jobs. Let me just recap a little bit. The issue is we're all analog creatures. We talk about a digital world, but you and I, we are analog creatures. We laugh and we love and we hate and we cry and we get angry and we get lazy and whatever. But we are analog creatures. I'm you are seeing me and listening to me in analog, even though there's some digital stuff in between. We're communicating in analog. Now, the issue with that is how do we interface, how do we survive and add value in a digital world? Because we, we, are, we are flawed analog creatures. The first, and I like this one, and I showed it to you in December, but do not appear in front of a judge just before tea or before lunch. Because you're, this is Israeli data, but your chance of a favorable outcome is zero. If you appear in front of a judge just before his tea break in Israel, you're not going to have, it's not going to end well. You're going to get a fine or go to jail. But if you go to him after he's had his morning snack or his lunch, the chances of a favorable outcome are much better. Now, the, the point here is that we are subjective. We make decisions on the basis of how we feel. We're not objective. So that's, that's the first thing about us. The second thing about us, and I've used this example again, but I think it's a great example to illustrate our other three um, uh, frailties. Um, never, so on our online navigation is amazing, because imagine if Google Maps or Waze or whatever had to have a room full of people crunching numbers to uh, say, I want to get from here to Sant, and there's a billion other people in the world who want to do the same thing. They're never going to be able to do it. I mean, you could maybe do it for Brian. So I get in, and then you've got a room, and he plots all my possible courses, gets traffic reports, and says, go this route. But the fact is, if you want to do it for two people, you need double the, double the resources to do it. If you want to do it for 10 people, you need to double your resources. If you want to do it for 1,000 people, so we don't scale. The second is we take time to do computation. We take time. And the third, if you do make mistakes, we all make mistakes. So the point being is that we very subjective. We are costly to scale. We do make mistakes, and we are slow, which means that computers can do a much better job than us much of the time. And that a significant proportion of the jobs in the world, or the tasks, let's not call it the jobs, but the tasks. McKinsey predict that by 2030, about 35% of the tasks we do now can be automated. There's all these different predictions about how many jobs will be lost, but the, the numbers range between 10 and 40%. That by 25, 20, 30, something like that, between 10 and 30% of the current jobs in the world will be made obsolete. But the advantage is that we're incredibly resilient and adaptable creatures. And part of the, this program is to equip us with the tools necessary to respond that we can be effective participants in this global digital economy and respond and be effective leaders and lead the conversation. So the second critical area about our response is, 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 is the future of jobs and A, how we prepare ourselves for it, B, about how we prepare our organizations for it, and see about how we participate in the conversations about how does society respond. Let me move on to a third area. Who, who's heard of the Mirai botnet? So the Mirai botnet is it's a massive uh, denial of service um, botnet. It actually attacked a, a DNS management company called Dyn, D Y N, uh, in um, October 2016 and took down these guys, Airbnb, Spotify, Netflix, PayPal. Now these are not small, these guys know how to run infrastructure. They know how to do IT security. And the Mirai botnet took them down for a few hours. Just by the way, Mirai is Japanese for the future, which is a bit concerning. So 
we're seeing that this, you know, and um, Telcom and VCX have, have had their own problems with ransomware and so on. And what we're seeing, what's interesting is most of it is still, you know, like WannaCry. WannaCry is frankly, it is still crime because it's about ransom, you want to get rich out of it. But you're also starting to see espionage and cyber warfare coming into it. It's actually quite a frightening development. And hacktivism, where people, they just, they feel strongly about something so they go and cause cyber mayhem. Now the question is, how do we respond? And in the past, what we always used to do is we put up bigger walls, right? And uh, people think they can put up walls between the US and Mexico and we'll solve the problem. Now in a way, what we do is it's the, our, our cyber security has responded in the same way. It's about let's just put bigger firewalls and bigger infrastructure protection and it will be all right. Well, let me, let me show you a series of pictures and then we'll think about what it means. That's, that's quite a sobering set of images. But I guess the question to ask is, would bigger walls have stopped any of it? And the answer is no. Bigger walls won't save us. So the question is what to do. But if I take some of those examples, um, let's take the MH370 and German Rings example, which was the plane about to fly into the mountain. There it was, the person in the company, in fact, in the most sacred part of that business, in the cockpit of the airplane, that flew the airplane into the ground. In the case of the Las Vegas shooter, it was a person with no motive other than to cause mayhem. So the question I'd ask is how many, in, in metaphorically speaking, how many people do we have in the most sacred parts of our business, in the cockpit of our airplane, <coughs> that could fly our plane into the ground? How many people do we have inside our systems that could actually cause mayhem if the whole purpose was just to cause mayhem. So this is a very real issue. In my, in my view, one of the biggest issues confronting this digital future is about learning how to deal with the security aspect. But at the same time, recognizing there's a real issue about privacy. Because the answer is intelligence. In the physical world, it's about intelligence-based defense. It's about using intelligence to actually stop something before it happens. In the cyber world, it's exactly the same. But the, prob the, the, the potential for infringements and abuse of privacy are enormous. So as leaders in this digital world, we need to hold intention. One of the gravest threats to our economy, can you imagine if there was a cyber attack that just wanted to cause mayhem on ESCOM or on Airports Company of South Africa or air traffic navigation systems or our water supplies or indeed on telecom and the core network. But at the same time, we have to protect privacy. So I think the third real issue that we have to think about, what is the appropriate response, is this issue of cybersecurity and privacy. The fourth issue comes down to people and the attributes necessary to lead. Now, the question I'd ask you is who are all these guys? And I'm sure you might recognize some of them, probably not all of them. And what do they, what do they have in common? Well. Besides the fact that they are conspicuously male and unfortunately pale, <laughs> they are all very rich. This is their net worth in billions of US dollars. So that's you know, 36 billion US dollars. <coughs> These are quite a shame. That guy, he, doesn't, he hasn't a, a, a sort of amassed a great fortune, but he only earns about 100 million dollars a year. Um, so he's not, I don't feel too sorry for him. <laughs> what they do have in common also, is that they are the leaders of some of the tech icons that we talk about every day. Whether it is Google, SoftBank, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, etc. The other thing that all but two of them have in common, the two exceptions being Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Watting, is that they're all relatively old. They're all sort of 50, 50 plus. 
And the point I put this up is not because I want to say there's still a place for old guys in the business. And, you know, I mean, this idea that if we just flat out organizations with enough millennials and ponytails, everything will be fine. Which let me say, we need to have a lot of millennials and we need to have a lot of people that are creative and liberated to, to create. But the point is, the thing that made these guys successful and lead these companies to success is the ability and the certainty in their digital vision and the ability to translate a digital vision into a strategy, to translate act strategy into action plans, to translate action plans into measurable outcomes and to measure them, to hold people accountable and to close the loop and continuously adapt. These guys are also people that had those so-called old-fashioned attributes of teamwork, the ability to communicate well, um, the ability for perseverance, determination, attention to detail, doggedness. Now, the point being is talent and skills is one we all have to learn new skills to be relevant in the digital age, and that's what this program is also part of. It's equipping us with the right skills to, to succeed. But let's not lose sight of those, some of those old-fashioned attributes of teamwork, communication, hard work, you know, talent, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the necessity, if we expect our, if we leaders in businesses, and want to transform our businesses into be digitally relevant businesses. The ability to create a digital vision, translate that into strategy, strategy into plans, plans into outcomes, and to close the loop. These remain absolutely critical skills for the future. So it is about leadership and skills. Second last one. We all talk about innovation, right? I mentioned off by starting this whole digital revolution is about innovating and finding new sources of value. Now, what companies then is say, ah, good, we are going to create an innovation unit in our business. And I'm sure many of you will experience something like this. So we create the innovation team. But the problem is organizations, by design almost, we are designed as big organizations to suppress deviation, to, to, um, to promote predictability. So what we do is all the forces of the business close in on this because we want everything to be the same and behave properly and behave normally. So what we do is all these forces of traditional business um, close in on the innovative activity and eventually kill it. So then we say, okay, but the textbook says, therefore what we're going to do is we're going to take our innovation activity and locate it outside the business. But the problem is, so we create the startup outside the business. It's completely separate because they need to be liberated to succeed. But the problem is we forget that there's a thousand other startups out there that are the same as them, that are also liberated. They are completely independent. They are as hungry, they are as empowered to do what they need to do. And those competitive forces end up meaning that the chances of success of that innovation activity are the same as any startup, which is one in a hundred or something. So the innovation activity, if it's just completely displaced from the business, has the same chances of success as any other startup, which is about one in a hundred. So the answer is, <coughs> we, need to put the, we need to create the inacti innovation activity essentially separately from the business. In other words, in terms of culture, management, practice, what's right, how it governs itself, and so on. But we do need to create, sorry to use this, another intersection, which is to give it, to give it full use, unfettered access to some of the company's assets. They can be money, they can be the network, but it can also be customer lists, it can be channel, it can be intellectual property. Because then what this has is it has, it has all the benefits of being a startup outside, but it's got the benefits of the of the scale and the, of the necessary assets of the parent. And you need to do this often enough that you, by the time your core business becomes outdated and obsolete, you've got enough of these new dynamic bets placed in the market that you've actually got enough to actually take you into the future. So, uh, uh, of, of, and, and by the way, organizations don't like this because, and I've seen it, if I may say, I've seen it in all the businesses I've worked in, including Telcom and BC is that the core business, particularly this, we say, let's do this. Oh, but no, that will threaten our voice. Let's do this. No, no, that will threaten our outsourcing business. And we protect those old businesses at the expense of creating new innovative activities. And I think it's to the long-term detriment to the business. So it is an important issue that you're going to have to grapple with as digital leaders is how do we innovate, create innovative capacity in our businesses to succeed? Let me finish off with, with a fairly more, slightly more abstract one, but I think probably one of the most important. Last year, some of you guys might have seen there was a sort of online spat between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, where Elon Musk said, hang on, this artificial intelligence genie that we're letting out the bottle is actually really a cause for concern. Because once you, come, once you create AI, 
that can not only do a, a human job, but can actually program itself to do it better and better, and program itself to continuously improve. Where does that end? So we need to think about this genie we're letting out the bottle. Mark Zuckerberg said, you're just an old maid, you just want to suppress innovation, you don't actually know what you're talking about. So it was a bit of an online spat, um, and it was quite unseemly actually. And then at Web Summit, Stephen Hawking came in and said, yeah, and he's been saying this for a while as well, by the way. Success in creating AI could be the biggest event in the history of our civilization, but it could also be our last. Now, this might sound somewhat alarmist, but we do need to think about the ethics of all these emerging technologies and the appropriate regulatory structure. So let me give a few examples. We, at, at the simplest level, how should labor law adjust to, the, to robotics? Robotic process automation is one of the big things entering the workforce in sort of this, over the last two years and over the next five. What, what is the appropriate uh, regulatory response? I spoke about the digital divide and the need to think about different forms of redistribution. What is the appropriate legal and economic and government framework and the right ethical response to the levels of inequality we're seeing at the moment. But let's, let's get a little bit more far out there. So there's global treaties on nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, conventional weapons. There's no global treaty on autonomous weapons, robotic weapons. There are drones flying in the sky that can decide they're going to take that house out. What, what global treaties should there be? Should we as a non-aligned nation actually be leading a debate on that? Now, and then we get to the really, sort of the, it sounds really far out now, but AI, should we be regulating them? Should there be some uh, regulatory framework for researchers and developers of AI to say you can only allow a computer to program itself or improve itself so much? So these huge regulatory issues. Now, I mentioned the privacy ones earlier as well. But I do think, as leaders in this digital future, we have to be informed about these ethical dilemmas about where this world is taking us. And we have to lead in this. We have to be part of the conversation. And even as a business, we need to form a reform. We need to have a, a response to what the impact on jobs. How do we deal with it as a company? The balance between cyber security and privacy, how do we deal with it as a company? These are real leadership questions. Leadership is not about taking easy decisions. Leadership is about managing dilemmas. And as digital leaders, you're going to have to manage lots of digital dilemmas. So. I hope I have given you some sort of context for the program. And what we've tried to do is put together a program which balances the fact that yes, technology enables all of it, but it's about how our market and the society is changing and how the business tools and practices we have at our disposal are changing. It is about figuring out where to play and how to win. But it is also to start a conversation and give you guys a little bit of background to say there are these challenges. It's not a, it's not an, a universally rosy picture. There are challenges that this digital world presents. And we as individuals and leaders need to have um, a response to this. So hopefully this program will equip you, um, at least partly, will be a step on the, the journey for you guys as your evolution of digital leaders. And I honestly hope that this program will be, um, to some extent, a career-changing opportunity for you. And welcome to the program. I hope you have a great time. I look forward to the next uh, nine months with you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.